how Captel Biosmart can make PCA amplification more reliable. Um, Air Lab has, um, has sold uh, PCA workstation for about uh, 25 years uh, all over the world, and uh, we have uh, developed a large experience on this uh, very particular, uh, particular application. This year is a very, uh, yeah, very complex uh, application. And if we want to be sure to, um, to reach uh, the goal of this application, we must be very well organized to be sure that uh, this application is not uh, contaminated by uh, external contamination or by cross-contamination, and I will explain why. So, first of all, um, uh, I will just start with uh, the news. It's not the news today, but for about four months uh, or six months in Asia, uh, we have faced uh, a, a unique situation with epidemics of COVID-19. Uh, COVID and it made uh, PCR uh, more popular for most of the people in the world. First of all, uh, here in Europe, uh, we are at the end of the confinement period, and uh, we call this new time the time for uh, tests and um, uh, uh, testing the people who are exposed to COVID. And there is uh, two types of tests that will be used in the next weeks. Uh, the first one are the ones that are called uh, serologic uh, tests, and the other one are what we call RT-PCR. Um, I will not spend time to develop serology tests. The only things we've got to understand, serology tests are, are used uh, to determine if one patient has been exposed uh, to COVID-19 and have developed uh, antibodies uh, to fight against, against this epidemic. Uh, so it does not mean that the people are sick. Uh, they were sick in the past, but today they, they can uh, be safe again. Uh, RT-PCR, by contrast, uh, is used to detect uh, the virus in the body of the people, and uh, it's used thanks to nasopharyngeal uh, pharyngeal, uh, samples. Uh, and uh, so PCR will directly determine if in your body, in your blood, uh, you host uh, um, the virus. And it tells you, so if the people are sick, whatever uh, the symptoms are. So this is what we will talk about. But so uh, PCR, it's not only used for to detect if people are uh, exposed to a virus or not. So uh, PCR uh, has been developed about, uh, know, was developed about uh, 40 years ago, and now is used in a very large uh, scale of application. I think the first one, the most popular one, is probably a forensic application. So um, uh, we've seen that in a lot of movies or uh, theories on the TVs. Uh, when you you find a sample of blood or something like that, it's a way to determine uh, who are the culprits. So this is one of um, the major application of PCR. But it's also used for the detection of microorganisms such as virus or bacteria, whatever for sick people, but also in water treatment or things like that can be used. Uh, it's also used for uh, prenatal uh, diagn uh, diagnostic uh, or uh, for proceeding to. Um, sorry, I've got a screen problem. Okay. Uh, to proceed to establish parentage. Uh, so uh, if you're not sure who the parents are, it's a way to determine who they are. And more largely in biology, uh, vegetal uh, biology or um, animal biology, it's very common application. Uh, wherever you use this application, so uh, this this application is very, very difficult to achieve uh, with no risk of contamination. And if if the samples are, com uh, are contaminated, first of all, it can lead to an overcost. Uh, in Europe, we estimate that uh, 
PCR analysis for COVID-19 cost about 135 euro. And so if the results are not reliable, so, so it means that you waste money, uh, totally waste money. But also the wrong diagnostic uh, can lead to uh, a bad treatment. And uh, the consequences of the bad analysis can be worse than only 135 euro. Um, if we talk about uh, forensic, um, a bad uh, or a wrong uh, PCR amplification can also lead to uh, judis oh, I don't know how to pronounce it, judicial uh, errors. And more largely, uh, a wrong usage or a wrong, uh, a bad uh, protocol for PCR can lead to wrong research interpretation. So to understand where uh, this errors come from, first of all, uh, we've got to come back to the basis. And the basis is that in a PCR application, there is three major steps. First of all, when you sample blood or when you sample um, biological sample, uh, first of all, you've got to extract the DNA that is hosted in the stair. And for that, you've got to break the, um, uh, uh, the wall of the stair and to remove the RNA or the DNA from the stair. So there is two different cases. So first of all, um, if the if the sample is not pathogenic, uh, you only have to protect you against the chemicals that are used for the extraction. But if um, if the sample can contain pathogenic cells such as uh, COVID-19, in that case, there is no other choice to use a BSC type 2. A BSC type 2 according to European standard or to American standard, whatever. So in that case, so you must ensure at the same time uh, the protection of the sample and the protection of the user against pathogenic, pathogenic uh, organisms. That said, after the extraction, that can be performed as an example. Uh, there is mes many methods to, to make this extraction, but one of, that is teaching uh, in college or um, or school in Europe is to use a mix of panel and uh, chloroform, uh, which is um, efficient. But that said, when RNA or DNA is extracted at the end, it's very important not to uh, keep it in the same PCR because uh, the extracted uh, RNA or the extracted DNA are very, very sensitive uh, to contamination. So that said, you cap your sample and you've got to move to move them to a special place, a PCR uh, workstation, where the samples will be both protected against uh, cross-contamination and uh, um, environmental contamination. That's the place where uh, the extracted DNA or the extracted uh, RNA uh, will be mixed with the different uh, reactants that are used for the amplification. That said, uh, that done, uh, the samples are ready to be amplified. And again, the amplification must not be done in the PCR workstation. Um, that, that must be done externally, but um, as the amplification is made in a capped, um, in a capped uh, container, there is no risk of, co of contamination during the step of amplification, and it can be done directly on the, uh, um, on the bench in the thermocycle. So, um, this is um, uh, just a, a reminder. When we talk about uh, PCR, um, it's called polymerase chain reaction. That's for me, probably one of the most uh, amazing application in laboratory. So the, the idea of PCR is to amplify, um, to amplify RNA and DNA thanks to, um, to um, a process that mimic what happens in the cell. Uh, as example, when you use RNA, uh, the idea is uh, first to use reverse transcriptase in order to create 
um, a DNA uh, single strand that is exactly the image of the RNA. And as DNA uh, can combine to another strand to make the double, um, uh, the double strand of DNA, so after one cycle uh, from one uh, from one strand of DNA uh, of RNA, you will create one double strand of DNA. Before cycle two, uh, we dismantle the two strands into uh, the two uh, combined strands into two single strands that will each of them create two uh, two double strands, and we do that multiple times. So after about one hour of test from one single strand of RNA or of DNA, you can produce up to one million uh, double strands of DNA. So, and due to this uh, amazing difference between the number of DNA or RNA at the beginning and the number or the quantity of RNA and DNA at the end, there is a big risk to contaminate the original samples uh, with a large amount of uh, amplified DNA. So uh, when we talk about PCR, so I would say there is three major uh, or three major uh, goals. First one, fight against cross contamination between uh, uh, two samples that are analyzed at the same time. Uh, the second one, protect your samples against environmental contamination. So all the DNA or RNA that can come, comes from the environment and the first contaminant is the, um, uh, the technician that will perform the application. And the last uh, contamination is the contamination of pre-amplified samples by amplified uh, DNA at the end of the application. So that determined that the reason why, so during the second step of PCR, what we called uh, pre-PCR, uh, it is very important to use a specific enclosure, and the one uh, we use at your lab is what we call uh, CAPTA BioSmart. And the CAPTA BioSmart will um, will achieve two main objectives. The first one, protect samples against environmental contamination. And I will explain, but it's made uh, using um, HEPA filter, uh, and we will push the air in order, in order to create um, positive pressure, in, dust, dust free positive pressure enclosure, where the application can be performed with no risk of contamination. And a air barrier in front of the enclosure will avoid the, uh, the technician to pollute or to contaminate his application. And the second goal of the capital Biosmart is to decontaminate uh, the enclosure between two uh, process or two application of preamplification. So, so uh, how it works. Um, so the idea is that in the room, uh, you've got a mix of uh, air and pollutants. And these pollutants can carry uh, DNA or organisms that, that can pollute your application. So the idea is to uh, push the air uh, through uh, HEPA filters, high efficiency particulate filter, that will uh, remove all the contaminants uh, from the air before uh, pure air will reach the application. And then the air is exhausting uh, from the face of the enclosure in order to uh, push the air to the operators and avoid the operators to contaminate the application. In the Captain Biosmart, we can use two types of um, particulate filter. H14 filters with efficiency higher than 99.995% uh, or ULPA filters, uh, U16, uh, with efficiency of 99.999% uh, uh, 
985%. So according to EAN 1822, uh, and I will explain uh, what it traps uh, in the following uh, slides. And uh, capture biosmarts can also be uh, um, combined with optional molecular filters. So uh, recently, researchers have shown that in certain cases, uh, VOCs of the atmosphere can also contaminate uh, PCR amplifications or in, in certain circumstances, it's very important to protect um, uh, samples against VOCs. So uh, here we've got um, uh, a drawing that shows uh, what can be tracked by uh, uh, HEPA filters according to EN 14175. Uh, at the beginning, there is a kind of misunderstanding. People um, sometimes just think that um, HEPA filters can trap uh, particles higher with diameter higher than 0 0.3 micrometers. It's not totally true. Uh, in fact, uh, in a HEPA filter, there is different kind of um, reaction or uh, action that can uh, that can occur. Um, diffusion, interception, and inertia. Uh, so depending uh, on the size of, the, of your particle, so the bigger the particle is, uh, the better it is tracked uh, up to a certain point. Uh, and around 0 0.2 uh, micrometers, the curve is inverted. And then the smaller the particle is, also the better it is trapped due to uh, uh, contact or uh, brown diffusion in um, uh, in the filter. So now, uh, according to EN 1822, it's uh, totally admitted that EPA filters can trap uh, everything between uh, 10 nanometers up to uh, millimeters uh, uh, with efficiency higher than the one that is um, determined into the standard. And here, as an example, we can see that uh, bacteria size, uh, the smallest bacteria that got diameter around 0 0.2 micrometers. And we can see here that there is no problem to trap it. And for virus si uh, sizes, uh, um, most of them have got uh, dimension higher than 20 nanometers. And According to this, uh, this test, the NPPS test, we, we can show here that he's uh, trapped with no problem. Also, it's good to know that most of the time bacteria or viruses are not carried uh, alone. They are carried by uh, little drops of water or dust. And most of the time we trap the mix of virus plus dust or plus water uh, or little drops. Another very important question and very common question coming from customer is that uh, how can we evaluate uh, the, uh, the cleanliness of the atmosphere into the enclosure? Um, for that, uh, we can use different standards and the most commonly used is the ISO 14644 standard. Um, that is written for uh, to describe clean rooms and associated controlled environment. We can say that uh, a captive biosmart is uh, an associated uh, controlled environment. In the ISO uh, 14644, uh, 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 the idea is to sample the air into a room or into a workstation thanks to a particle counter and to um, to compare the results of your particles counting to uh, this chart and here as example you can see different classes of um, air cleanliness from ISO 1 to ISO 9 and as example if I select ISO 5 when I compare my results um, of particles counting I must ensure that there is not more than uh, 100,000 particles of diameter higher than 0.1 micron 
per cubic meters of atmosphere. Or, and at the same time, I must not have more than 3,522 particles of diameter higher than 0 0.5 microns per cubic meters of, um, of air, of sampled air. So um, that means that uh, depending on your particles counting, uh, you can uh, reach certain level of cleanliness. Also, what we've got to understand is that um, uh, the results not only depend on filters efficiency, it also depends on the environment. So uh, to uh, obtain a very good uh, cleanliness, you need a very efficient filter, a very good uh, vent uh, vented enclosure, but at the same time, the environment where, uh, where the um, enclosure is installed must not be too polluted. That's very, very important to understand that. The other uh, important um, information is that uh, the most commonly used uh, standard is the ISO 14644. But in the world, you can find customers referring to other standards. And one very popular standard that, I, that is less and less used in the world, but still present is the US federal standard uh, 209. And on this uh, slide, I. I give you uh, some equivalence between this, this American standard and the ISO standard. And as example, an ISO 5, uh, according to the um, uh, 14644, is almost equal to uh, a class 100, um, uh, according to the federal standard 209. 100, according to this standard, means uh, maximum 100 particles of 0 0.5 microns per uh, cubic feet of air. You can also compare the result of uh, ISO 14644 according to the good manufacturing practices that are used in pharmaceutical industry. And an ISO 5 is equal to a class A or B according to the GMP knowing that the differences between A, uh, A or B classes depends if your uh, room is tested under activity or is in standby mode when you test it. So uh, we can also ask ourselves um, what is the cleanliness we're looking for for PCR. Um, the most commonly requested um, air cleanliness for PTR, but that's also the same for uh, BSC, the internal environment of BSC, is the ISO 5. And here you can see that ISO 5 is also what is the most commonly used in pharmaceutical industry, in surgery rooms, as example. For better cleanliness, uh, sometimes you, you find it for microelectronics because uh, it's very sensitive, uh, light is very, very uh, sensitive to uh, dust uh, and lower uh, cleanliness, you can find them for uh, in agri-food industry or uh, special industry or painting cabins, as example. Uh